All right, awesome interview today. I got muscular the, the voice of muscular development, Ron Harris. What's up, Ron? What's doing? How you doing, John? Thanks for having me. Oh, of course. Are you kidding? It's my pleasure. <laughs> I, I, you know, I had uh, in the last month, I had uh, Jay Cutler. I saw wow. Ali, uh, Alicia Young, yeah. and, which got a lot more views than Jay. Really? Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's, un- <laughs> it's unbelievable. And, uh, and now you. So we're wow. doing we're doing pretty damn good. Good company. Wow. Well, I don't think I'm beating Jay, but you know what? That, that's good company. I don't think anybody's beating Alicia. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, unbelievable. Wow. It, it must right. be the blonde and uh, the the beauty and she's she's a hot buff chick. I mean, yeah. What's not what's not to like? Yeah. Tell me about it. It's the truth. Yeah. But um, so before we get into like muscular development and everything, I know you're a bodybuilder and you obviously are in love with bodybuilding. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it full time. You know. Yeah. Um, so why don't you, uh, break down for me from the beginning, uh, when and how you fell in love with bodybuilding, who inspired you, and then we'll get into the muscular development and the interviews and so on and so forth. Sure. So, uh, I was lifting weights for a few years before I really had any awareness of what bodybuilding was. I was a very, very small kid. I was either the shortest or second shortest in every, every class I was in. Really? And, Cause you look, yeah. you look. How tall are you? Because when I'm watching, you look taller than most of the bodybuilders. You should ask, how tall was I? I was five, eight and a half at one time. And now I'm down to five, seven and a half. I'm trying to fight the shrinkage, but man, yeah. So, uh, yeah. How, I old got, are you? how old are you now, Ron? I'll, I'm 52. I'll be 53 in September. Okay. I'm 46. Okay. Oh, you're still a kid, man. Still a kid. <laughs> so, uh, well, for the, when I was 13, that Christmas, I got a weight set that I asked for. Started training at home. With that little Marcy weight set, um, ended up going to the boys club, was lifting weights. My inspiration back then wasn't bodybuilders. I had seen Pumping Iron late night on PBS one time, but mm. I would say it was more so professional wrestlers because I grew up, uh, you know, born in 1969, 70s and 80s, especially the 80s, a lot of big muscular wrestlers. Big time. You know, Ultimate Warrior, uh, geez, those, uh, the British Bulldogs, on and on and yeah. on. Hulk Mc- Hogan. McMahon loved the big, strong dudes. Yeah, and I mean, I was inspired. That That's what inspired me uh, initially. Yeah, I so, actually had a couple of guys. Um, I had I had Mr. Wonderful Paul Andorff's son. Wow. Yeah, Travis Andorff. And I had Big John Studd's son. Had them as students? No, 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 no. On my show, interviews. Oh, 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 okay. Wow. Yeah, I'll send them to you when, when we're done. So, so yeah. Interesting. So, so, <laughs> so professional wrestling. And where did you grow up? Uh, Waltham, Massachusetts. It's about 10, 12 miles west of the city, Boston. Okay. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I had a crush on this one girl, Nancy, who had two guys on her wall. One was uh, Kerry Von Eric, the wrestler from Texas, the late Kerry Von Eric, bless his soul, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I said, hmm, I think she likes buff dudes. So that was another, that was another, that was another thing. But I didn't really become aware of bodybuilding until uh, I had just started freshman year of college. I went out to University of California, Santa Barbara. I had bought some weeder weight gain shake in the summer and a little packet on the side you could send away and they'd send you a free issue of Flex magazine. So my mother forwarded it to me and I, I got it in the mail and I'm in there and it, I open it up and I'm seeing Lee Haney, Rich Gaspari, Mike Christian, Gary Stridham, Lee Labrada, uh, Barry DeMay, Mike Quinn. I was just, my mind was blown. Sean Ray was in that first issue too. Yeah. Even he was an amateur. So I said, I got to look like these guys. I got to look like these guys. And um, unfortunately it was a little, I wouldn't say unfortunately because I learned a lot from, but I started off, I went into a Nautilus phase, Nautilus machines only for about, Good year and a half, close to two years, because I read the the books by Arthur Jones and Ellington Darden, PhD. They were such an amazing salesman at making you think that Nautilus machines were the only legitimate training tools and barbells were obsolete. And I mm-hmm. bought it hook, line, and sinker. But I you, still, I still you weren't the sinker. only one. You were not the <laughs> only one. I read the first gym I went to uh, was Ferrigno's gym. And oh, wow. yeah, because I'm from Brooklyn originally. Yeah. And uh, he had one in Brooklyn once that now, and he had a ton of Nautilus stuff there. Hmm. So, you know, so free weights too. But I remember like, what is this? Because I'm a little younger than you. Yeah. So, yeah. but it was like the early nineties by this point. And like the Nautilus phase was like, was that was gone by that point. Yeah. But, I mean, we, even I was too, I wasn't there for the height of the Nautilus craze. I caught the tail. I'd say I caught the tail end of it. Okay. All right. So go ahead to so the Nautilus stuff. Yeah. And then I'll just jump into it. How I got into competition. That was, uh, so 
Uh, that was spring of my sophomore year of college. I was training in a Nautilus room in a YMCA in Boston where I would go in between classes. I, I transferred back to Boston, went to Emerson College. Uh, so I was training there and I saw on the newsstand when I was going to buy my my flex, my muscle and fitness, my muscle mag, my muscular development. I bought all. I knew when they all came out, I was always at the newsstand in Copley Square, downtown Boston. And I saw once a natural bodybuilding. I'm like, wow, what's this? I didn't know, you know, I was natural, but I didn't know that there was anything as far as like competitions or magazine or anything like that. So I saw, and I was like, wow, this is crazy. These guys, you know, some of these guys, I'll never look like them, but some of them, I, I think I can look like that eventually. Yeah. And um, in the back was like the contest schedule. I had no business competing. I'm 19 years old at the time, uh, about 145 pounds, 50 pounds soaking wet. But uh, I saw one that was coming up in about eight or 10 weeks. That was like a half hour drive from my house. And that was March 89. That ended up, ended up being my first contest and ended up competing in about 30, 31 shows from 1989 to 2013. Wow. Yeah, wow. So that's, the, that's my bodybuilding history. I did see your 2013. That was Team Universe, right? Yeah, I did Universe and Masters yeah. that, that summer. Yeah, I was actually at that show. I was oh, at, wow. yeah, I was at the, because um, I had moved from, uh, I was from originally Brooklyn, then I was in Staten Island, then I moved to Jersey, and I live in New Jersey now. Yeah. And I trained at Guy's Gym, Guy Del Corso. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he, yeah. he, would, he would always work for the NPC backstage. Yep. And on the weekends, uh, he would ask the guys in the gym, oh, you know, you want to work because we need guys. And him and Maz would try to get the guys from the gym to work. I was like, yeah, I'll work. So I was there like 12, 13, 14, <laughs> you know. Oh, that's how old you were? You were only like 12 or 13? No, 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 no. no. In no, 2012, no. 2013, <laughs> 2014, yeah. you know. This way so, yeah, that's all right. So I mm -hmm. remember... Uh, seeing you, I saw John Meadows in 14 when he yeah. turned, I'm pretty sure it was 14 when he turned pro. I mean, you know, so it was, it was pretty cool, but yeah, I do remember you and you did not turn pro, right? No, no. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 20. Yeah. 2013 was probably, I, I, I always say the 2013, uh, you, you, it, was, it was still called team universe back then. Yeah. The, the masters over 40 that year, which I was in, it was the closest I ever came to being in a pro show. There were 23 or 24 of us mm -hmm. and it was over 40 with no weight classification. Mm -hmm. So I think this, there was out of the 24 guys, I think the lightest guy was around 150 or 155. And the heaviest guy was the winner, Malcolm Marshall. He was 280. Wow. So it was like an old pro show before there was a 212 division where you'd see like, you know, Steve right. Brisbois and Ralph yeah. Moeller. And it was crazy. Yeah. But I ended up getting fifth at that. Um, and then masters, I didn't do well at all. Like I was like the worst place in my career actually it was 13th out of 30. There were 31 guys in the over 40 heavyweights. That was the last time I was ever on stage. Yeah. Big class, big, tough class. Yeah. I, uh, I pretty much, I didn't compete as many shows as you did, but I kind of had probably the, the realization in 2014 when I saw John Meadows, because 2014 was my last contest. Yeah. And I won the Brooklyn Grand Prix um, Masters. Okay. So I'm feeling myself, you know, I, I won a bunch of Masters. I won 2012, 2013, 2004. I'm like, you know, next year I'm going to go, I'm going to go do a national level show. Let me go check out Team Universe in 2014. You know, I was going to be there working anyway. Yeah. And I see John Meadows warming up in the back and I went, okay, I'll never look like that. <laughs> I'm never going to look like that. He and that was, else. yeah. And I was like, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> he, he was, he was one of the best amateurs for years and years. He had yeah, yeah. so much dense, thick, rugged muscle, like that yeah. grainy branch Warren Dorian look. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't, I feel like he didn't get enough credit for the physique he had because he was so brilliant and he shared so much excellent information. Mm -hmm. I think people focus more on that, but he was a damn good bodybuilder. Yeah. He was a tremendous body. And I don't even think he gets enough credit for being a trainer. I think if he would have lived, he would have been in the same category as a Pharaoh or, or an Aceto or a Charles Glass because he was yeah. tre tremendous in the gym and so on and so forth. A lot of people trained with him, Fouad and uh, Sean Clarita and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, okay, so the magazines start tapering off in middle 2000s, 2010, yeah, give correct. or take, right? And, mu and muscular development was one of the biggest, one of the best I used to get the subscription to muscular development. And then were you with the company when it made the transition? 
from yeah. magazine to it's still we still have a print magazine. We're the last uh, print magazine in bodybuilding. Really, we still put an issue out every month. Yeah, I guess not everyone knows that, but no. If follow, yeah, if you follow uh, just the Instagram Muscular Development, we put like the new covers on and stuff. Uh, we, we post those and everything. But um, no, I had been a freelancer, uh, independent contractor for them from 2001 all the way to 2017, mm-hmm. where I was strictly a writer. Um, yeah, I would go do some show coverage toward the end of that. I would do some show coverage here and there, but nothing like what I do now. Because in 20, January 2017, I took the job of online editor, um, you know, running, pr- trying to produce all the content and handle that, and manage that for the web, for the YouTube channel. And I'm still doing all the writing. Mm-hmm. So all in all, I've been with them now. Uh, wow. Over, over 20 years. A little over wow. 20 years. So did you always... Were you always a freelance freelance writer full time throughout your bodybuilding career? No, I started out. I, you you might be old enough to remember this on ESPN. There used to be a show called American Muscle Magazine. It was a magazine format show. It had I different so. segments. It would have like uh, like John Romano had a cooking segment on there at one time. Uh, we had like the Valio workout where like a different pro every month. A lot of times we had guests guest hosts were pros. Contest coverage, profiles, cooking, fashion, gossip. It was a really cool show. It was a one-hour show, and then it got moved to a half-hour show. Anyway, so that's how I got my start in the industry. In January 1991, um, I went out to Los Angeles from Boston to intern for them, and he basically hired me right away. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I was working – immediately I was working on, like, the Olympia, the Mr. Olympia, the Ms. Olympia, the Arnold Classic, and the monthly show because we used to do event production and stuff for them too. But uh, I was writing scripts for that, and that's how I started – meeting the the must the magazine editors of photographers and a year into that job with the espn show i was at iron man magazine headquarters talking to john balick and steve holman and i said you know i i do a little writing how do how do i get some uh how do i get a, an article printed in your magazine he said well I'll submit it to us and we'll see if we like it and if we like it we'll use it and we'll pay you a little bit i'm like oh all right so we had fax machines back then and uh, I printed out on the word processor. I'm like, yeah, oh, my God. Good. Yeah. OK. Yeah, I think it was a word processor and faxed it over. And that was my first article. That was like spring of 92. And so I started out with Iron Man magazine. Uh, from there, I reached out to Muscle Mag International. I did a lot of work for Muscle Mag over the years. God bless the late Bob Kennedy. Okay. Um, and his fitness. He had like a couple men's fitness magazines. I did a lot of writing for that. Planet Muscle, Jeff Everson, the late Jeff Everson's magazine. Muscle Media 2000. Uh, which was Bill Phillips, T.C. Luomo was uh, the editor, became Testosterone, then it became T-Nation. Uh, did, did a good amount of stuff for them over over the course of years. Mm-hmm. And then MD, MD was actually one of the last magazines I started writing for. But for good, the first 10 years or so I was with MD, I was still writing for everybody else. It was I was doing a lot of writing. Like I was doing an average of 250 to 300 articles a year. Wow. Now, there were, they had a lot of writers uh, and they had a lot of, I, th- I think it was Muscular Development that had a lot of actual pro bodybuilders uh, yeah. that would write, have columns, right? I think, uh, didn't Lee Priest have a column? They and, all did. They all yeah, did. they all kind of did at one, at one point, which, which was a little bit forward thinking, if you will, right? Because now, and, uh, you know, you kind of get their opinion on a YouTube channel or a podcast or whatnot. But back then, there really wasn't another magazine doing that. Am I, am I accurate? Yeah, there, well, I, sh- I shouldn't say. I mean, Flex Magazine had some athlete columns, but it wasn't that extensive. We had, at, at any given moment in that, that era where the magazine was between four and 500 pages, it was huge. Yeah. In that era, the, the peak of the, the print magazine's uh, prominence, I'd say between 20 and 30, 25, maybe sometimes even 30 pros under contract, but I'd say average is 20 to 25. Wow. And they all had columns. There was a whole section. I think we put it all in one section of the magazine and it was all the Q and A's. And I did most of them. I was a okay. ghost writer, but I did call the guys up with the questions, record the calls and transcribe it. So it was, it was their answers, but you know, these guys aren't going to sit there. Most of them and type up a thousand pages every month. A thousand oh, I pages. see what you're saying. So it's basically, you're, you're doing the writing. You're basically just asking questions and so on and so forth. And they're just, and then you put their name to the column. Correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Did that, did that go? Cause didn't you see, you mentioned John Romano, didn't John Romano and Plumbo also work for muscular development at that point? Did you do the same thing with them or they had a different. Uh, uh, so, job title? so the job titles for them were Dave was the first online editor when the, 
when the website first launched, Dave Palumbo. Mm -hmm. And at that time, John Romano was the senior writer. So uh, fast, that was 20, geez, 2000. I think it was 2005, 2006, maybe it was five, 2005 or six. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were, they were there for a few years. And then um, there's been a succession of online editors. I've actually had the job. I think I've had it longer than Dave had but before me. No one had it more than like two years, a year to two years was the average. Well, I think Dave had it in the, in the back of his head that because he's been on my show and we we've talked several times and yeah. he kind of knew that he was going to move on and start his own business. You know, I think it was, yeah, yeah he's not a stupid Stupid man, no, he's a very I mean, smart businessman. I think he basically knew that. Okay, you know, the, 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 he he knew that things were changing, and this is going to be a YouTube channel podcast thing for very soon. And that's when he started RX Muscle and so on and so forth. Yeah. But he, here's one great question that I came up with today: oh. when when muscular development was competing against magazines, like you kind of knew how. I, I would assume you've been in the business so long as a company like Muscular Development. You know how to compete with magazines. So, you know, we kind of have like the insider scoop of who's putting what in what article and so on and so forth and contracts with different bodybuilders. And I'm going to take photos and we're going to do with the this interviews and right after the Olympia, right before the Olympia, so on and so forth. Yeah. Then you, then you transition to online stuff, to YouTube, to podcasting. And now you have to compete with a kid in his basement that's basically doesn't have to go to the shows like yep. you go to the shows. And he's just putting uh, pictures of the bodybuilders that he just saw in his live stream and um, commenting. Yep. And so you're competing with uh, like a Nick strength and power who turned who, who today is like probably the largest bodybuilding YouTube channel in the world, if you will. Yep. And he does everything from his house. How do you make that adjustment? We're competing with somebody who is basically unknown until, you know, the last few years. Yeah. You know, I give Nick a lot of credit, Nick Miller. He's, he found the niche. Uh, he does great work with his and, videos. And he's not the only him. one. There's a bunch of this. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, that's he's, top. But he's, he's the top of the food chain. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, he does an excellent job. But like you said, it's tough to compete when, you know, it costs money to go to shows. To right flights and hotels and I eat a lot of food. Um, yeah, it's, you have to try to give some, give them something they can't get from someone who's at home. So mm -hmm. when I go to the shows, I'm making it a point to talk to the athletes before the show, talk to them right after the, after the show. Mm -hmm. uh, I, we try to get work with people like Milo Sarshev. I like to work with him at shows and get his commentary on the judging or, you know, mm -hmm. as soon as it's over, things like that things that we can do from people that were actually at the venue. And if you have the actual athlete too, like a winner interview with the guy who just won the New York pro or the Arnold classic. I mean, that's something that, you know, Nick can't do. Right. I can't do what Nick does, but Nick can't do that because he's not there. Right. Although he does go to shows sometimes. I sometimes he does go to shows. Sometimes he has booths and so on and so forth. But I think the majority of bodybuilding fans do what I do. So here's what I mean by that. If I want to know who won, I'm at work. Like a lot of times I'm working on a Saturday and there's a show. I want to know who won the prejudging. I go to Nick strength and power. Cause I know he's going to have it up. Boom. Yeah. But if I want to see like an interview with like, you know, Brandon Curry, right after the Mr. Olympia contest, I go to muscular development. Cause I know, I know Ron Harris interview, right. And I don't want to see what he has to say or the number two guy or the number three guy. And I also know that it's fresh right after. So you get there, they're real, real feelings right afterwards. Cause there were, there were a couple of times where I've watched you interview people right after a contest and you got that, that raw emotion. Like I shouldn't have got second place. I should have won this. You know what I mean? Th and, and that's, that's their initial. Then they kind of like, I think every bodybuilder goes to, goes to this. Right. And then they kind of like, okay, by the third day, they're like, all right, you know, you get to, you interview them on the, a week later. It's a big difference from interviewing them right off stage. Sure. So do you remember any kind of interview where you had right off stage where it was, it was a bit controversial because the one thing about muscular development today, you guys really aren't controversial. No, 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 we're not, you know, we don't do, I, I don't want to demean it by calling it TMZ type stuff, but if somebody gets arrested for hitting their wife or, yeah, yeah, I saw that. Sorry, drug, drug possession or <laughs> whatever. I mean, that's fine. It is news. It's legitimately news. I just don't, 
I don't care to report on all that stuff. This yeah. is my personal choice. And I know I'm missing a, a huge segment of the audience that really wants the dirt. You know, people love dirty laundry, like the song says. Yeah, but I don't want, you know, I don't like doing that stuff either. I know I'm obviously very small. I'm not nearly as, you know, but I know exactly who you're talking about, but I don't want to go to a contest and have people go, oh, hey, that's that son of a bitch that's talking <laughs> about me. You know, I don't, and, and, and that person uh, has to do, has to, has to be that person. And, and hey, listen, if you could deal with it, great. I, I wouldn't, I have such a, an interview show, like 90% of my show is an interview show. Yeah. But I can't risk that. I need people to like me. <laughs> you, you know what, John? Uh, one thing, I, it took me a long, unfortunately, it took me a long time to learn. I'm a slow learner. And I always have to <laughs> learn, learn the hard way by effing up. But I learned that this industry is so small, so incestuous, you cannot afford to burn one bridge. Right. Anytime you think you're never going to have to work with someone again or need something from them again, you're proven wrong eventually. Sooner or later... Everyone knows everyone. Right. People switch companies. Eventually, this person that you thought you'd never have to deal with ever again in your life, you got to deal with them. So I'd rather be in a at least a neutral position, if not a good position, with everybody. Right. I don't want it. You know, in the feeling, like you said, I have I go to all these shows. I don't want to have to be like having people stare me down or avoid people. I don't want bad karma, bad vibes. You right. know, I'm there to do a job, and that's the last thing I want. Is like that's that asshole that called me a this or that. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't need that shit. I don't need, no. need that. <laughs> I, I, so going back to the question, was there ever a time where somebody came off stage? Uh, any, anything that sticks out in your mind that was so emotional and so moving, whether it was, whether he said something controversial or whether he was so emotional because of a particular win or emotional because he lost Anything, anything that sticks out in your mind that's really special? Um, I haven't had too many cases where someone like was really angry. If someone, if there was a placing like that, if someone got quote unquote robbed and they're just, you can tell they're just seething. I don't go up to them and say, Hey, can we grab an interview? Cause I mm. know either they're going to tell me to go F myself <laughs> or they're, they're going to, they're going to do the interview. It's very unlikely, but if they do the interview, very good chance they're going to say something they regret. And I might get a call like an hour later saying, oh, bro, you need to take that video down. Mm. Uh, I can't. I said this or that. And judges, yeah. I said the judges are full of shit, you know. Um, yeah. But there have been a few cases where people were so happy they won or they had overcome some challenges. Like I think Blessing is a recent example that he got really emotional. He was like struggling not to cry during the interview um, because it was just, you know, he's talking about coming out of Africa, being smuggled out at nine years old. He hadn't seen his father in 20 years. And, you know, people think he's this clown, this jokester, but he's got quite the, quite the backstory mm. coming out of Nigeria. But yeah, yeah it's, it's those, those are cool moments though, because it's someone who's really, they're just overcome. They're crying tears of joy, really. Mm -hmm. and the fact that they, they can't believe they finally did it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's gotta be pretty uh, impressive uh, um, and interesting. Because a lot of these guys have some backstory. You know, a lot of people, the majority of bodybuilders basically, oh, I, I was a football player, I was a wrestler, and I fell in love with the weights and so on and so forth. A lot of them come from middle-class homes. But the ones that come from, you know, like you said, that come from, uh, you know, Africa, Trinidad, uh, to the Dominican Republic. I mean, Vic Martinez has, uh, oh, the, the, the amount of drama that guy had, had, I don't even know how he could stick to a diet because he had so many things go between getting arrested twice and breaking his arm and his sister dying and, uh, you know, drug charges. It's just un unreal. But so now getting back to this, uh, the controversy, mm -hmm. if I ask you, like, for example, um, right now, the big thing is with uh, Bob Ciccarello and Fuad Abia, right? That's, yeah. that's the gossip going around. Yeah. Um, yeah, right. Exactly. That's the gossip going around. And some people have uh, their their views and some people some people have different views and so on and so forth. What did you think? Because I watched the Fuad Abiyah thing and it looked like to me that they were just kind of just shooting the shit. And he didn't want to mention Bob's name, even though he didn't have to. Um, and Bob kind of like got offended by it and shot back. But it didn't look like it didn't look like Fuad intended, to me anyway, this is my opinion, didn't look like he intended to offend anybody. That's usually not his, his makeup. 
Um, I kind of understand what he's saying, like somebody to, that's for the athletes to go to. And I think they were just throwing points around, you know, yeah. what was your take on it? Yeah. I feel for Bob because what can an athlete's rep really do in pro bodybuilding? It's, it's not like the NFL or major league baseball or the NBA where, you know, there's a, there's, they're all players unions. Am I right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, you know, they have a lot of power. And if, if they ever go on strike the way MLB did a few years back, I mean, mm-hmm. they've got the, the organization by the throat because they're losing billions of dollars while these guys are, are not playing. Mm-hmm. Um, bodybuilders don't have that kind of leverage. So I don't know what a rep really could do because you, if you're a, if you're a mediator, the people you're representing have to have some sort of leverage. But uh, the one thing I did agree with Fouad, and I don't know if it's ever possible is the black backdrop. Yes. Because did you ever have a chance to either go to, I went to almost every pro Ironman show. I think I went to like 12 or 15 of them. They were the best lit shows you've ever, you could possibly imagine mm-hmm. because John Balick was the promoter with Mike and along with Mike Nevy, they co-owned Iron Man magazine. Mike Nevy was the chief photographer, did all the covers. 90% of the stuff inside the magazine was Mike Nevy photography. He was so good at light and shadow and at light, especially lighting. He was a master. He still is. He's still working, but he lit those shows the way he would light the studios for the bodybuilders photo shoots. Mm. The guys look spectacular. There was like a little backlight. So it'd be like a little ring of light around them. And it was just perfect sculpted lighting. So you see like, you know, Flex Wheeler's first win was the pro Ironman a week before the 93 Arnold classic. Mm. And those pictures, he wasn't as crazy shredded as he was a week or two later, but man, the lighting. So it was a, it was always a black backdrop because if you want to do that kind of lighting, that's what you need. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I agree that these giant led screens, you know, it's amazing. Wow. It's a lot of money. I know they cost a lot of money. It's amazing technology, but they do take away a lot of times from the bodybuilders physique, especially if the black, if the background behind them on the LED screen is really light and like flashing and these guys are all, even, even the, the white guys are painted pretty dark. Yeah. Everybody's looks like a silhouette when the lights like that behind them, you try and take pictures uh, and the flash can only do so much. So it's, it does take away from the physiques. I don't know if there's a way to integrate that where you could have just a black section in the middle, but then, you know, the sponsors, they want the sponsors logos on these led screens. It's, Right, right, right. It's you got to look at both sides and there's no there's no easy answer. No, I I, I totally understand. The only thing the only thing, you know, things like that, like the black drop and the backdrop and the judges and the lighting, um, you know, it would take a while to figure out and so on and so forth. But the the only thing that uh, I don't understand why there's not a paramedic or an EMT worker or a physician's assistant backstage. Because there's always, not always, but there's been times where people have collapsed, where people were um, uh, uh, dehydrated, where, you know, um, uh, Dallas McCarver collapsed at the, the, one of the shows before he passed. Yeah. And maybe just, you know, maybe just, you know, if you had somebody there, they could kind of, uh, you know, figure things out and uh, the well-being of the, of the athlete. That would be the only, like, major thing that I would kind of, require really okay other I mean, than that's, that, other than the, that what, the what Olympia else? has that and the Arnold has that but I, I agree with you every show should have that just like even you go to a Pop Warner football game there's an ambulance over there at the edge of the field right right you know, right it's right. a sporting it's a, it's an athletic event I mean you wouldn't yeah. think bodybuilding it's not football players smashing into each other nobody should be getting hurt but we all know there's things being done at the last minute especially that yeah have cataclysmic results what so was that have, what was that famous picture? Was it Paul Dillette that was on the table? Uh, well, Paul Dillette was carried out like a statue, carried off stage. His whole body went into a, it basically froze into a mm-hmm. uh, man, like rigor mortis. And they carried him off. Three guys carried him off stage like a giant mannequin. Uh, he was, he was, was a, he That's was like the dude. one Arnold I missed too. I'm, not that I'm ghoulish and I wanted to see that, but I kind of, kind of wish I'd seen that. Um, and then didn't Milos actually save somebody's life? Uh, I think they, some, something to do with the diuretics the person was using and they wanted to I, give him potassium and he, he stopped them. Yeah, stopped that's the right. Milo, from giving him to, from potassium, something to that effect. Yeah. Milos did that, but you can go back. There's stories like I think Samir Banut when he won the Olympia, mm-hmm. uh, was it Tom Platts? I can't remember. I think it was Tom Platts. I could be wrong. Somebody did the same thing. Like he was cramping up and the guy, they were going to give him something that would have made things much worse and right. Platts or whoever it was. So yeah, these, these things, it shouldn't it shouldn't fall on the fellow athletes to medically assist 
the uh, the bodybuilders. But yeah, that would be the only thing is like some kind of PA or some kind of something like that. Um, that's, backstage. That's an, easy, that's an easy fix. What, what would right. that run like a thousand bucks? Yeah, most? seriously. And most of the time they'd be sitting there shooting the shit anyway because most of the time everybody's fine. But sometimes these things do happen. So, but who knows? Yeah. So. You go to all the pro shows, or do you just go to the top ones? Do you go to the Olymp- I know you're at the Olympia, you're at the Arnold. Yeah. Um, and- I wouldn't say it's, it's, we go to as many of the top ones. We don't go to all of them. We try to go to the ones with the strongest lineups mm-hmm. because that's where you get the views. If you cover a show where there's no big names in it, and we're spending, you know, we're taking a, we have high tech pharmaceuticals as our sponsor that allows us to do all our contest coverage and I'm grateful for that. Mm-hmm. But we're still, we're putting out a good amount of money to be at the shows and to do the coverage, you know, we're, we're paying, we got a staff and all that. So to try to cut our losses to do as well as possible. Yeah. The Arnold for sure. The Olympia for sure. New York pro always uh, Boston pro. We went this year, Chicago pro is our next one. I'll be at Tampa pro. I'll be at the Texas pro. Okay. Giles will be at the, uh, the Arnold UK and we should all be at the Olympia. All right. All right. Cool. Where is muscular development? Where is their main source of revenue coming from now? Is it the YouTube channel podcast? No, I would say, you know, I'm, I, I don't know the financial particulars. Okay. It's, it's above my pay grade, but uh, <laughs> I believe most of it's from advertising. It's from the sponsors, the advertisers. Ah, okay. 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 Cause all right. That makes more sense. I was going to okay. say, because the views on, on muscular development compared to like a Nick strength and power, you know, uh, I don't know how, I don't know how Nick did it. You know, he must've just got right before the YouTube bubble. He must've got in right before, you know, um, it's gotta be difficult. Like I, like we were trying to say before, there has to be some amount of animosity where you have this kid he's a young guy and he's making all this money by just did diddling with his computer because he's computer savvy. Right. Yeah. And, but, and then there's muscular development who is putting out a shit ton of money with a lot of employees and, and they have to compete with this. Is there, is there any kind of like real animosity or is it like, ah, and this is, this is the world we are in now? No, I, I know Nick. I, you know, I've met him many times. I like him a lot. And, um, you know, he doesn't quite get things right all the time only because he hasn't been, he hasn't been around that long. You know, uh, he's not, he's not really a historian of the sport. You know, it's easy for me to sit here 50, almost 53 years old and, I've been going to almost every Olympia since Lee Haney won his last Olympia. It's easy for me to say, oh, why doesn't he know all this history? Well, he wasn't around. So Yeah, he's a kid. I, but, you know, I, I see him as, as motivation saying, this is the new model. This is how things need to be done now. This is, print is, it's still around, but it's not what it used to be. Mm-hmm. You have to change with the times or else, you know, you sink. So yeah. he's inspiration because he's a great example of someone who's doing it right. He's got over a million subs. I think he's got like a million and a half now. Yeah, yeah. Most of his videos, you know, regular video of his gets 100K. Contest time, we talk Arnold and Olympia videos on those weekends, he can get like 500K on those videos. So, Oh, yeah, he, know, gets, he, he gets a ton. He's doing something very, very right, Nick. He's very good at what he does. Yeah, a- absolutely, 100%. Yeah. And then you have other – then you have certain bodybuilding um, – YouTube channels that are kind of like both, like they, they're controversial and they cover and so on and so forth at the same time. And I think they try to fill, I think they try to fill both, you know, niches, if you will. Yeah. Has muscular development ever considered doing something similar? Um, well, I think we do. I mean, we do report on news. I, I, I go live a lot of times. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, the, oh. I'm talking about the gossip oh. and the controversy. Oh, and no, no. And you no. know what? A lot of things that you echoed in your own thing. I work with all these athletes. Okay. Um, I need to do interviews are like my bread and butter. I do yeah. a, an interview show, the wrong line report where I need to have like three or four good ones every week. So if I get some guy so mad that he's never going to interview with me again, and this is a small industry yes. and then another guy and another guy, and this guy's his best friend. So he's like, F Ron Harris. He's like, right, 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 right. Can't do that. No, it, yeah. it's, it's, would not be in my best interest or MD's best interest. So, because I'll it's, lose, it's, I'll, I'll lose the views. It's in this case, I'll, I'll, I'll have to. So, do you have full say over the YouTube channel views for muscular development? 
Um, you know, I, I shouldn't say that. I mean, uh, Jen Geraci, who's our chief operating officer, mm -hmm. she edits the videos, she monitors the channel. I mainly put out the content. I don't really manage the channel uh, to the extent that she does. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm really a content creator. Okay. All right. All right. And then you have like, uh, basically, then you have shows where it is um, not exactly, it's just an opinion-based show. Do you know? I think uh, Louis Marco was kind of like a, a, a show like that. I don't know what happened to him. I know he got threatened a couple of times because yeah. people didn't like his opinion. But he was basically just an opinion-based show where he just went over a, 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 a contest and then he gave his opinion. Um, and he was pretty critical at times, you know. Yeah. Um, and I remember that. Uh, I remember that time that um, uh, what's his name got really angry at him. Oh God, he came in second in this year's uh, Arnold's Classic. Oh, Bonac, William Bonac. William Bonac, I'm really angry at him. I don't know what he said. And then you have like, you have, you know, you have content creators like that, where it's basically my opinion, you know? Um, and then you have the ones that are just straight up, I'm going to give the gossip and the controversy and I really don't care. And I'm looking for the views and the hits and so on and so forth. Yeah. yeah. Which ones do you think are going to last? I think they're all, if you look at the views, they're all getting consistent views. Mm -hmm. There's, there's an audience for all of them. You know, it's amazing because there's so many YouTube channels now. So many, oh, it, co yeah. it costs nothing to start a YouTube channel. You don't even need a cool mic like, like you have there. You can use your phone. <laughs> yeah, it's the truth. You can do everything on a phone if you want. Yeah. And I've seen, not in the bodybuilding arena, but I've seen some YouTube channels where it's just somebody in their phone and, and no fancy backdrop or nothing. And they're getting crazy views because the content's good. It's what they're saying, what right. they're talking about. Um, I think there's, there's, you know, a lot of people have a lot of time on their hands these days and they spend a lot of time on their phones watching videos, mm -hmm. or tablet or whatever. So I think there's room for everybody. You know, okay. it's, not, it's not like I don't see any channels going away, I, especially in the name channels. I haven't seen right. one disappear. Yeah. Well, Louis Marco, I don't know what happened to him. I think he kind of disappeared. Yeah. And then there was a vegan, something. Vegan, gain, vegan gains. Yeah. I don't know what happened to him either. You know? Maybe he eats meat now. I don't know. Who the hell knows? Well, what I'm trying to do, which is like, I'm trying to basically model myself as a small version of a Valuetainment or Vlad TV or Rogan, where it's basically like an assortment of different types of interviews. I mean, I'm a huge bodybuilding fan, so I get a lot of bodybuilders, but yeah. I've interviewed uh, former mafia members porno stars, 1% bikers, uh, conservative podcasters. I mean, uh, professional wrestlers, you go down, go down the line, yeah. so on and so forth. And the whole reason I do that is because not to cool off. Right. If that makes sense. So that like, uh, like, for example, there were these um, YouTube channels that were really hot a couple of years ago when it was basically a men's channel talking about men and how modern women are ruining dating and so on and so forth. And all these guys are chime in and now that's really cooling off. Is it really? Yeah. It's really kind of starting to cool off. Right. Like oh. after Kevin Samuels had, had passed oh. and then the, the mafia thing is really cooling off. You know, now you're getting guys that are, you know, did three years in jail and coming out and saying, <laughs> you know, they're so on and so forth with all the bodybuilding websites that, and I'd rather YouTube channels. It's my opinion that the controversial ones might run out because that's what it seems like. It seems like the Louis Marcos, the vegan gains, so on and so forth. <sighs> because the, the guys like RX Muscle, Hostile, Muscular Development, they have the money, they have the backing, they have the people, they have the talent, and uh, they have the ease of which to, they could bring a lot of good people on. Where, again, this is just my opinion, the controversial stuff, to me, it gets old, but maybe, maybe it's just me. You know what I mean? You know, what could happen in that scenario is a few people who do the controversy stuff very well. Like I think Nick Trigilli yeah. does a fantastic job. He's, he's stacking up enemies like pancakes. But that's, but... What, that's what I mean. Like, <laughs> as soon as, uh, as soon as I, uh, I saw that one today about the bodybuilder that punched his wife, yes. man, I, must have, I watched two seconds of it and I shut it off and I'm like, okay, this is, 
yeah. I don't want to watch this, you know. Um, but that might just might be my opinion. I don't know what the 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 general public likes, you know. Well, look at it's the views. That's yeah, all you gotta do. Look at the well, views. Yeah, but right now, do you know what I mean? But like, for example, like I I compare this stuff to like re- reality shows like ten years ago when they were hot and then they kind of die out. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. Uh, do you think he's you think he's safe? You think he's gonna be around? Well, I, I, Right now, I think he's the source. He's the best source. I mean, that's who does it. Who does that better than him right now in our in our industry? No, you're 100 percent right. As far yeah, as so, and, and he can think, give two fucks either. Like he can give. That's he what I'm give. saying. And so <laughs> I don't see him going anywhere because I think a lot of people. The channel's fairly new, considered mm-hmm. you know compared to RX and MD and and Generation I. It's a new channel. I think it's because he's got. I think he got shut down once. Anyway. Look at he's the person. A lot of people every day they're gonna they have their notifications where they go check what's the what's the scandal today, what's the gossip today, and they go to they go to bodybuilding BS. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. If, if there's a hundred channels like that in bodybuilding, I think yeah, it probably would eventually, you know, come down to a few of them that are, they're doing it better than everybody else, and those will be the ones that people will go to, and those will last. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Uh, see, I didn't think about that when I was. When I was making my point, yeah. When I compared it to the reality shows, the reality shows really died out because there was so damn many of them. Yeah, Sat- saturated. Yeah, where Nick is like, you're right. He's the only one doing it and doing it on a consistent basis every day, day in, day out. And I don't know where he gets his info from because, like you said, he's really creating a lot of enemies. You know. Well, I mean, here's two things: is he's he does know a lot of people. He is he's been around the industry for a long time. Mm-hmm. He is a pro, so he's got a lot of good connections. So he can get, he does have people texting him shit all the time, like yeah, feeding yeah. him, guess what happened? Guess who's dead or guess who's arrested? Or He has all that coming to him and he does have that unique, I don't give an F attitude where, yeah. oh, well, I'm going to report on this guy getting, uh, this guy and his wife getting arrested for having drugs mailed to them. Or I'm going to say this guy cheated and tried to, you know, the judges tried to help him cheat into the classic class, even though he was over the way. He says things and he knows there's going to be tremendous backlash and he just doesn't care. Yeah. And I yeah. mean, that's, that's who else can you put in that? You know, that, that's why I give him like, he's in a unique situation. No, God, yeah. Can. God bless him. I couldn't do that. I, no, I couldn't do that. No. Do you, uh, two, two things. One's a, do you know how I got Jay Cutler? I went to the New York pro cause it's right here in my, in, in my backyard. Phoenix. And then, yeah. And I literally just hang out. I buy the tickets, I hang out, I watch whatever class I like to watch. And then whatever, whatever, whatever pros come in that I feel like would be a good interview, I just run over <laughs> and, and, and say, you know, would you, you know, and that's how I got him. I literally darted over like a, like a, like a, like a barracuda. And I was like, Jay, you got to do, luckily Guy Sistanino was standing right next to him and Guy had done my show. So it was e- very easily verifiable. You know, but um, that's basically what I so I can't go to these shows if people hate me. So I can't do that. I mean, he's done videos about JJ scamming people with this net. Dorian, I'm like, man, Dorian, that's the last guy you want to. Jay and Dorian are like the last two people you want to piss off in this industry. Everybody loves him, yeah. well, especially Jay, more so Jay. Yeah. Everybody loves Jay. Um, and this Dorian's just someone you know you don't want to mess with. Dorian, just put it that way. He's okay. He says he's he's a. He's a nice guy, but you don't want to piss him off. You don't want to be on his bad side. Oh, really? He was, he was a tough dude back in the day. He, very much so. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, now, do you get that? Do you get a lot of text messages and DMs? Uh, I found this out. I found out this gossip. I found out that gossip. And, uh, not, and they, so, not so many. You know what? And I bet it's I bet it's because people know I don't do any of that. Sometimes right. I'll get all that just because they want to tell me. They mm-hmm. usually unfortunately the last two years it's been like deaths it's like did you hear about so and so and i'm like what they're dead right yeah, yeah they're dead i'm like yeah i, I figured yeah um but you no know, i don't i don't get too many of the the gossip gossipy stuff sometimes i do mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but uh a what? lot of times they're telling me it's already been reported anyway yeah that's that's the that's the <laughs> i tried doing that I, do you remember when generation iron on able first put out that the rock was going to do a bodybuilding contest <laughs> and i like i i picked up my laptop and then I, then I said April fools on the Instagram post. And I was like, I shut it down. I was like, okay. That was, that was ridiculous. <laughs> now, what do you think? Why, why do you think so many, it kind of slowed up. Thank God. Why do you think so many bodybuilders in the last couple of years have, have passed on so suddenly? 
I don't want your channel getting shut down, but uh, the virus and the vaccine, both of them. Yeah. You're not the um, only person. You're not the only person who voiced that it, opinion. It's I don't know why. And I'm not a scientist or a doctor, so I don't have any you know, valid opinion on the matter. But they call it the clot shot. It, call, it causes clotting. The disease, it's, the virus itself causes clotting. Mm. Uh, and bodybuilders, by and large, a lot of us have our blood is too thick. Our hearts are enlarged. There's blockage in our freaking ventricles, and it's a recipe for disaster. So, uh, you know, that's the first question when someone dies. A lot of people are like, was he vaxxed? Did he get the jab? Mm -hmm. and, you know, who knows? I mean, we've had all these bodybuildings like nothing compared to what was it? There was like a, in six months over in Europe, all these all these young guys, 20, 24 to 30 years old, professional soccer players, or anyone dropping dead. Wow. You know, kids who young guys who should were in amazing physical condition. Mm -hmm. no, heart you're not, attacks. You're not the only person who has that opinion. Um, I do a show with Jason Arns where yeah. we like basically preview contests or we just shoot the shit or whatever. And when that was happening, we talked about, I think it was um, uh, the bull that had just passed. And uh, he has the same opinion. And mm -hmm. if you really think about it, it's the only thing that it's the only common denominator really in the last couple of years that that something drastically changed was the, 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 the vaccination and the, and the, and the disease, you know, that was the only things everybody else is doing the same crap. Right. And it, it wasn't happening here and there. It would suddenly, but for the most part, um, you really wouldn't uh, get any of that. It was, we, we had an epidemic, an epidemic of, yeah. of premature deaths in bodybuilding. And, you know, people say, well, was, they were on steroids. Yeah, they were on steroids. And that's probably the mix of what steroids do to the body and the way it interacts with the vaccine mm. and or the virus. Right. Together, it was like a nuclear explosion. And we were, mm. there was a point where it was like every other week. Yeah, it was some, bad. Some, somebody with a name passed away. And they yeah. were usually under the age of 50. Yeah, it was really, yeah, it was getting to, thank God it like kind of slowed down. Yeah. There's, well, there's another, that's another, uh, there's another type of, bodybuilding youtube channel that that goes around that, that i can't stand that i absolutely hate that i will never give any time to and that is the person that is going to tell you all about um anabolics and how to use them and how much to use and so on and so forth and a lot of times it's just somebody making these insane oh you could put 20 pounds on in you know a month if you really if you listen to me and you do this and that and so on and so forth Sounds like someone in Thailand. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And I re absolutely refuse to give uh, him uh, any kind of uh, any kind of views. Uh, Call him Voldemort. Yeah, he who shall not be named. Yeah, I've I've done a couple shows with people just getting opinions. I actually did one with Jose a couple weeks ago, Jose Raymond, mm -hmm. because uh, I won't mention him either. It's no, it's it's fine. He's Doctor Twenty Huge. Yeah, but yeah. he runs exactly. these crazy experiments. Over there, they just did this mass blast thing, like you're talking about, to see how much mass they could put on. And was it was it nine days? Uh, something, something ridiculous. ridiculous. Yeah, and this one ridiculous. one kid, he was a young guy, or looked like he was early to mid twenties. Didn't look like he ever touched a weight in his life, and he was on five grams of testosterone, oh, week, thirty to forty IU's of GH, and what put him in the hospital because his blood sugar went so high was. 200 units of Lantus insulin with breakfast and a hundred units of fast acting with five more meals, 700 units of insulin a day. Yeah. He ended up in the hospital and that was the end of it for him. So those videos are so irresponsible because, you know, I, I came down on, I commented when Trigilli did a video, I put some comments and they came at me that even one of the guys in the contest really came at me. They like, they made mocking videos of me on their Instagram stories. And, um, but you know what? They're saying it's for entertainment and this and that. It's just, you know, it's just, we're just trying to be a, you know, controversial, entertaining. And, you know, you and I both know there's some 15, 16 year old exactly. kids. Exactly. Exactly. They're going to say, okay, five grams of tests. Right. Exactly. 40, they're going to do exactly what they see these guys doing because they want 20 pounds in nine days. Sign me up. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Especially at 14, 15, 16 Ooh. years old. Who do, and you know, you're playing football or you're, or, you know, or you're too small to be a, a fullback or whatever the case may be. Oh, I mean, I remember when I was a kid yep. that was, you know, in the 90s and we didn't have social media 
And it was just rumors floating around, yeah. you know, that, uh, that so-and-so does this and so-and-so does that. And that's all you're doing. You got to do more than this. And so, and now you have these guys that are actually just saying, yeah, 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 do, do, you know, so on and so forth. And then what happens is you get somebody like Ian Valier who goes, I do 750 milligrams a week. And everybody thinks he's lying, Yeah, yeah. you know, and it's like, no, he doesn't, he has, he is a genetic freak. He could probably do nothing and grow. That is, you know, the biggest, one of the biggest problems in our, I wouldn't say industry because we're, we're broadening this to talk about it. anyone that really, all these kids that aspire to look like that is it's a denial of the fact that these guys that they're emulating are really craving to look like they are the genetic elite. It's a rare thing. I say, how many guys do you see walking around that are six foot eight or taller? And they go, geez, you know, very rarely do you, I said, that's about how rare it is with someone with those really great genetics for bodybuilding that they do a little bit of gear, train hard, eat right. And they just blow the F up. They look right. like, like you could never look regular. People can't look like that. That's it's, right. it's, you have to be, have that perfect storm of DNA in the womb. Yeah. Well, uh, that's actually a really good analogy. The analogy I use is uh, cause I've, I've, I've gotten, I'm sure you've gotten this. You're looking at a magazine or your phone and they're going to say, how long before you look like that? You're doing all the right. And, and, and my answer is always, uh, if I take batting practice, can I bat like uh, Mike Trout? <laughs> no, 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 no. If, if I, if I take piano lessons, can I be the next Mozart? No, I'm never going to look like that. Those are the very, very special. That's, that's it, you know? And uh, yeah, that's it. That uh, the six foot eight analogy is, is, uh, is, is a good one too, because it's more of a, physical uh anatomy analogy it's it's you know what it's, it's always i think it's easier it's less painful to sit there and say this guy looks the way he does because he's on two grams of test and a gram of trend he's on 20 i use it to, to think that that's the reason he looks like that rather than accept that i could take all the drugs in the world i could never look like that that is just a very rare gifted individual and i'll be i'll be very honest the only thing that I've never tried, the only thing that I haven't tried was insulin. Yeah. And I just, that was the reason why I was like, all right, I'm done because I just couldn't get the results. And then when I, like I said, when I saw Meadows at the team universe, that's when I was like, cause I was already like 36 or something like that by that point. And I'm like, this, I'm wasting my time here. I bet, you know what I mean? I've, I mean, I've had people tell me, oh, if you do, you know, this, this, and this, you put on this, and it just never, it never came. You know, you got to eat and eat and eat. And I would eat and eat and eat. And the only thing that happened was I would get fat. And, you know, it's just, it, it's just not, not the same. And I didn't want to be the guy that was just chasing the pro card. Mm. You know, I didn't want to be uh, that guy. I thought, it, I thought it would be, but when I found this, it kind of fulfills that void. You know, when I sit here and I talk to people like you and when I talk about bodybuilding, it kind of fills that void because um, I don't have to have a pro card to be relevant, just like yourself. You're, you're one of the most relevant people in the, in the industry, but you don't have to have that, that pro card. And let's face it. I mean, when you and I were young, pro cards were few and far between. Now there's so many damn classes. It's like, oh, I can't. I'm not big enough to do bodybuilding. I'll just drop into, you know, classic. I'm classic. I'm too old to do the open. I'll just do masters, you know. And it's just, you know, go down the list, you know. Yeah, I mean, I've seen some cases. I'm, I will not be specific, but I've seen some cases where pro cards were given to people at a show who looked eight to ten weeks out, like. Yeah blurry everywhere not a, not a deep clear cut anywhere on their bodies um and once i saw that i said why do i care about not being a pro if that right. if that's a pro and you know the I've, I've never even been that fat in my life <laughs> yeah yeah what well, was it um back in the day if you won the nationals or was it the usa didn't you get a didn't you get a direct invite to do the olympia that same year no in fact just it's I don't know if you realize this, but back in the early days of the NPC, like when Lee Haney won the first nationals in 1982, right. he won the heavyweight and overall. Do you know that didn't even get him a pro card? Really? Back then, in the first few years that the nationals existed, you still had to go to the world amateur championships and win your class 
you'd be up against the light heavier heavyweight from UK, Egypt, in Kenya, Iran, China, you know, 30, 40 other guys. Yeah. And that's how you got your pro card. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And now there are some shows that uh, if you come in second in your class, you get, you get a pro card, right? Uh, I've seen people that were the only one in their class at a pro qualifier. I think they've changed that. I don't think they do it anymore, but okay. I distinctly remember uh, a couple times, I think, that someone just won by default. Nobody else was in their class. Mm -hmm. And you know, one time it was a woman who had, I'm not going to shame her, but she had these calf implants that were like <laughs> basketball and her breast implants were, yeah. If you've yeah. seen those like plastic surgery shows where someone comes in and they're like off their rocker, they yeah. already have a breast this big and they want it to be this big. It was like yeah. that. Oh, so God. yeah. I mean, I, cause you're almost old enough. There were guys back in the day, like, uh, Geez, who just he just passed away not that long ago. Matt Mendenhall, Edgar mm -hmm. Fletcher, Rory Littlemeyer. Uh, there were people that didn't get pro cards back in the day that would mop the floor with 80%, 90% of the people that turn pro today. Yeah. Well, that's the that's the other argument, right? That's the other argument is that there were guys that were so good, such good amateurs back in the day that they deserved the pro card. So the guys that, you know, come in second, you know, you give them the ability to maybe shine years later or something to that effect. Yeah. Now, I don't, because I'll be honest with you. I, and I, and I love bodybuilding. Like I'm a hardcore fan. And I was going through the list of this last Portugal pro and it's called the big man pro. Yeah. I, I think I recognized three people. I had no clue. I think I knew, I knew uh, the two Italian guys and, uh, is it Klahar, is that his name? Peter, uh, Clancher, Peter Clancher from Peter Croatia. Clancher. Yeah, right. And I knew those three guys. Everybody else, I had no idea who who it was. Yeah, and I, I follow because I've you know we I only know a lot of the European guys because we have Giles Thomas who does our MD Global Muscle Show. Mm -hmm. and he's he's on he's the European journalist. He knows everybody, so he usually tells me about these guys long before anyone in the U.S. knows about them. But yeah, you're right. There's no, there was no Americans in the show for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of new guys coming up, there's a lot of new blood. There's a yeah. lot of new blood in 212. There's a lot of new blood in uh, open. Who do you, who, who stands out to you? Who do you think? I mean, you can give me the top five, top 10 guys you think who, yeah, and you've seen them up close and personal on stage. Who stands out to you where you're like, yeah, this guy is going to be dangerous or this or this guy is a future Mr. Olympia or this guy's a future Arnold Classic winner, so on yeah. and so forth. I mean, in the open, you, you got uh, Hunter and Nick are probably the two most exciting guys because they're still so young. Yeah. And they're not where they're going to be yet. They're still works in progress. They're getting better and better every year. Mm -hmm. you, know, you still have the veterans up there. But, you know, I think this is where I think Rami announced this is last year. Yeah, um, something to that effect. Curry's probably not going to be doing this too much longer. Uh, he's mm -hmm. getting close to 40. I don't see him doing it for more than another couple of years, two, three years. He's had quite a career already. Uh, Bonax getting up there. You know, it's the young guys. And class, I think classic is where you see a lot more crazy potential as far as there's a few guys out there now. Ruffin could easily. Yeah. He's a potential. He's two-time Arnold champ. He could win the Olympia. Why? He's been second place twice. Yeah. Um, man, this German kid, Urs Kalachinsky, is phenomenal. Yes. yes. He's Looks amazing. More, he's gay. He's filling out that upper body to match mm -hmm. the legs. The Brazilian guy, Ramon Dino. Yes. Yeah. Super, and classic. Yeah. And classic. Super yeah. impressive. Classic. Logan yeah. Franklin in Texas. Milos works with. Classic has a lot of exciting new talents. It's probably the division where we get at least once, once a year, if not more, Someone new we never heard of who's just awesome, and they're already like top five at the Olympia level. Yeah, no, that seems to be the uh, the most popular one now. I mean, I, I, there are kids in the gym, young guys. I mean, like you know, in their early twenties, nineteen, they know who Bumstead is. They have no clue who Big Ramy or William Bonac is. You know, it's just I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know where the change happened or whatnot. I don't know. Maybe because it looks more attainable, which it isn't. But um, <laughs> uh, but um, in the in the open. There are guys that are coming out, out of the woodwork, as far as I'm concerned, and they look amazing. Whether it's like a Derek uh, Lunsford who just blew everybody away at, you know, in, in Pittsburgh this year, blessing, blessing, and then you got like Andrea Presti, where he has such a really beautiful physique, you know, um, and if he just made some some changes, uh, he could really do a, a lot of a lot of damage. 
what what guys do you see that catch your eye that go okay listen if he is if this guy could work on this he's going to yeah. be dangerous if he could bring up that he's going to be dangerous sure so you know you just mentioned presty presty i just did an interview with him last week and he talked about the fact that he had he had torn his quads three times and his hands once and he's finally been injury free and finally for the first time in something like three years getting really good leg workouts again because that's his that's his achilles heel his lower right. body is not does not match that upper body mm-hmm. um phil clayhar is i wouldn't you know he's 48 years old wow he's, is he he's, come, he's coming on strong the jamaican tank looked amazing in texas last year with kuklo and valier that was a that was a great top three. Oh, um, that's right i know who you're talking about okay yeah from the yeah. back he, the, that guy's got like a mr olympia a rear double by that guy's yeah. back is unbelievable it's crazy yeah um, tony o'burton he's brand new to the open division it was a 212 he's he's a work in progress uh i think, I, think I know the black guy with the tattoos right yeah he was third place okay at, yes the uh was it the Cali puerto, show? puerto rico pro puerto rico pro yeah, yeah 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 so he's good he's gonna be good i mean that that's the great thing is it's it's like any other sport you know old old talent retires goes away gets phased out and there's always new, always new blood coming in. Do you think Lunsford's going to go to the open? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so too. I think, so. I think he's just too, too massive. It's it's the fact that he's gained. He was already at the limit for the past couple of years. He did the two twelve, and then he's clearly put on significant mass since then. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to give credit because this is not my original statement. Tragilli said it today in a video. He said he's going to look worse as a 212 if he has to lose all that muscle to come down to 212. Yeah. He's going to look flat and stringy. Even with Hani Rambo, one of the greatest coaches of all time, mm-hmm. I don't think even Hani could could help him in that situation. So I'd love to see him 225, 230, yes. big, full round yeah. On, the, yeah. On, the Olymp- yeah. on the open stage. Yeah, I had a conversation. I go to the same gym as um, Clarita, and him and I had a conversation about that when he first came out in Pittsburgh. And uh, we were talking about, you know, whether he's going to do 212 or the open. And we were both like, if he comes down, it's going to be difficult for him. You know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of weight to lose. And he's another guy that I think could really hold his own. Like, you know, people are talking about, uh, uh, who's the guy who just won the Puerto Rico Pro and the Orlando Pro? Um, Hassan. 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 People are talking about Hassan Mustafa breaking the top six. Ah. I wouldn't be surprised if Derek Lunsford could break uh, the top six. Derek, at with that additional size and in great condition, he's got a much better structure than Hassan. Mm-hmm. He's so wide. His back and his shoulders got a narrow waist. He's brought his legs up a lot. Hassan has, I wouldn't say narrow clavicles. There's no pro bodybuilders with narrow clavicles. Mm-hmm. You're not going to ever see that. But they're average. They're not wide. And his hips, they're not narrow. They're average. So... Little, he's a lot more straight up and down. So when he's standing there, it's a ton of muscle. Right. So much thick, dense, round muscle, but it's pretty compact. Whereas Lunsford, even though he's a couple inches short of Hassan, he's so much wider. So much, it's, it's just a prettier structure. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I can't see Lunsford doing worse than sixth at the very worst. Yeah. Unless he just really fucking shits the bed. But I, 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 not with, I, not with Hani Rambo at the helm. Right. It's not going to happen. Uh, I agree. I agree a hundred percent. And, and, you know, a lot of the old guys like to talk about how they don't need, you don't need a coach. I did all the coaching myself, so on and so forth. The Hilly Pre saying it, I, you know, Sean Ray, but listen, you saw the difference what Farrah did with blessing. Yeah. And I don't know what, what they did together, but it made a world of difference. I mean, blessing was a totally different bodybuilder this year. Yeah. And uh, obviously it had to be Farron uh, directing him because that was the one thing that he had changed. I, and I also, I think it's the, you know, the kind of the every generation thinks the next generation sucks kind of deal. So on <laughs> and so forth. I mean, that's just, that's just you know, always the case, you know, but right. Right. Um, I think if these guys had uh, the ability to have a guy like that, help them out, they would. What do you think about the older generation kind of, saying these things about the newer, the newer guys, you know, like. I disagree with the coaching thing. I think coaches are important. You know, if if they'd been around back then, the guys would have utilized them. Right. Right. Boxers, MMA player, football, every, every professional athlete has a coach, if not several coaches for different, Mm -hmm. for different aspects of what they do in their sport. 
why should pro bodybuilders not have someone guiding them? You know, right. maybe you don't need a trainer. Maybe you can train yourself. But do you really think you're so spectacular with being objective and looking at yourself that you can control and make make adjustments as necessary? I don't think so. I think these guys that didn't have coaches, maybe they would have been even better with a coach. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. No, I uh, I, I agree. Um, the only the only drawback is the uh, the shithead coaches at the bottom of the barrel that you know that uh, you know that say they're a coach and they're really they're really not. You know, um, I've, only I've seen I've seen high school kids on on Instagram that are coaches. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, the, it's it's ridiculous. I'm only going to ask you a couple more questions. I don't want to take up uh, too much more of your time. Okay. Um, what was the other question that I was going to ask you? Okay. Oh, well, uh, I interview a lot of women's bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the controversy with uh, the Arnold Classic not having women's bodybuilding? I had done a live feed with three IFB professional women bodybuilders, and we kind of had a discussion right after the Arnold Classic about it. What, what's your opinion? I mean, it's, 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 their, it's the discretion. It's the decision of the Arnold Classic people, the promoters, right. but... Yeah, I mean, if you're going to have all these other divisions, why, why just why not have all? You might as well just have them all. You're already having, you know, they have. I think the 17. only divisions they don't. <laughs> no, no, there's eleven. But I'm saying the only ones that the Arnold doesn't have are women's bodybuilding, women's that's, physique. Right. Yeah. I think I that's think, it. I think that's it. I th they have men's that's physique. It. They have classic bodybuilding. Oh, they, they don't, don't have two. They, they don't, don't have two twelve. Yeah. No two twelve bodybuilding. So. You know, it, it's it's their choice. The Olympia has to have all the divisions. A lot of shows don't have all the divisions. There's mm -hmm. every weekend, if you follow the NPC or the IPB schedule, every weekend there's like two or three or four pro shows somewhere that might just have bikini and men's physique. Yeah, that's right. Divisions. That's right. That's right. Tons, okay. There's tons of those shows. They're all held with along with amateur shows. Um, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I didn't, even, I didn't think of that. Okay. But, you know, as someone who goes to the shows – um selfishly i appreciate i appreciate all the divisions everybody works very hard but when there's less divisions it's a short it's not as long of a day yeah. and night there's there's too many divisions and you know i'm not going to say this division shouldn't exist that shouldn't they shouldn't have this division or that division but it, with a show with full divisions that's 11 divisions and there's some pro shows that also will break it down and have masters if not two different masters classes for every single pro division, in addition oh. to the divisions. So it's that a week takes, long? It takes two full days and nights of, of judging and finals. Wow. Uh, I mean, that, that's got to be exhausting. I mean, it's, you know, it's tough. It's tough. <laughs> I mean, even, even when you go to an NPC show, you, you, you know, you're not getting out till 11, 12 o'clock at night, you know, because uh, uh, there's so many, so many divisions. Why so many divisions? Why do you think, especially women's divisions, why do you think there's so many women's divisions? Um, I think it was obviously just to bring more competitors in. Mm -hmm. These are, these are, you know, people have to realize it's, it should be simple. It should be obvious to everyone. These are, these are businesses. Yeah. You know, contest promotion is to make a profit. It's a business. It's not just, Oh, we, we love sports. We love the athletes and we love the sport. We're just going to put on a show. Well, you can't lose money. You know, right. blow, lose your own money. So Bodybuilding was starting to fade away. Less than, there were the competitor numbers were going down. What do you do? Uh, I think the first new division, the very first new division was women's fitness. And then it was figure. Mm -hmm. I think it was men's physique, bikini. You know, they, they went on and on and on until they literally had something for everyone. Right. If you work out, if you go to the gym to try to change the way your body looks, there's probably one of these divisions you could aspire to compete in mm -hmm. um, and that puts asses in seats because all these people bring their moms and their dads and their girlfriends and boyfriends and you know they bring people to watch them at the shows so yeah it's a business but it also opened it up because had it stayed pure bodybuilding which when i started out that's all there was it was just men's bodybuilding and women's bodybuilding mm -hmm. you went to a bodybuilding show that's what you saw that would not have sustained itself i think the sport the competitive side of the sport especially at the amateur level would have died off 10, 15 years ago, if not yeah. longer. Very good point that it, it has made it where it brought other niches and audiences in a hundred percent. Absolutely. Because like I said, they like the young guys, they know who Bumstead is. They know who these guys are. They know who Ruffin and Terrence is. They don't know the open competitors. You know, they made it more 
they made it as mainstream as they possibly could. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, I totally agree with that. One more question, Ron, and then I'm going to let you go. Okay. Are you working on anything yourself? You have anything that you're working on uh, outside of muscular development? Um, I do a little coaching on the side, but it's very little. Okay. I don't have a lot of time and I'm not the most patient guy. <laughs> um, I've done some fiction writing. Uh, I do plan to get back into that on Amazon, on anywhere you can download a book. I have a collection of short horror stories. Really? They're absolutely disgusting and dark and twisted. <laughs> it's called Evil X10. It's all, I think it's all connected. That's where I effed up. And that's why in the search, if you, Evil X10. Evil uh, X10, like the number 10? Yeah. Like Evil X10. Yeah. And it's the uh, 10 extreme tale, 10 tales of extreme darkness. Okay. And uh, people have read this and they like never wanted to talk to me again. So, so. <laughs> well, was, what I, I'm going to, not that I'm a huge podcast, but I'm going to put the link in Amazon. You said it's from Amazon? Uh, it's on Amazon Kindle. It's, uh, it's only, it's anywhere digital format is sold. Okay. The, the, you can download books. It's, it's a buck 99. <laughs> okay. And uh, 10 Tales of Extreme, what was it? It's, it, it's so it's Evil X10. Got it. And then semicolon. But if you put Evil X10 all connected with no spaces, it'll come up. It'll come up in right, so any, anywhere you can download to a, a tablet or whatever. Okay, so I'm going to see if I can find a link on Amazon and I'm going to put it in the description so people could uh, check it out and find it. Appreciate that, man. Ron, <laughs> it has been an honor having you on, man. Like, um, you know, you're one of the guys that I've, that I've always watched on uh, when I was uh, competing myself and on muscular development. It was always uh, you, RX Muscle, and then I really got into uh, Hostel. And uh, I really appreciate it, man, because you guys, you, you wanted the person, people that, made me want to do this. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. That's flattering, man. Thank you. You're very yeah. welcome, man. I appreciate it. Listen, much love, much respect. And uh, we'll, definitely, we'll definitely do it again. All right, man. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, John. R Ron, thank you very much, man. You're welcome. Have a good night. You too.